an introduction to the uh, three artists that are sitting in front. Um, we have Balatia Monareng, Chad Cordero and Nathaniel Shepard. All of them are graduates from the Witt School of Arts, but all of them have gone on to do interesting things post their graduation. Balatia is uh, working at the Center for Learning and Teaching Development at Witt's University. And uh, Chad Cordero and Nathaniel Shepard are part of the collective known as Danger Khafar Ngozi Studio, DGI. They're going to be presenting to us today a, uh, on the, the collaboration they did for the Labor of Love exhibition. And uh, the title of their presentation is Labor of Love, When the Flowers Bloomed. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, so I think to start, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what a labor of love was or the process of research um, going into the show that, that spanned about a year. Myself and Nathaniel were in our fourth year at the time, and uh, Bayitile was doing her MA. Um, so the show was co-curated by Gabi Gobo and Yvette Mutumba. Uh, Gabi was teaching myself and Nathaniel at the time. Um, so the year of research that went into um, Labor of Love started with uh, a collection that was collected by Reverend Hans Blum in 1986, which was a state, state of emergency in South Africa. And it was mostly Rock's Drift prints, but it was whoever um, kind of Hans Blum could get in contact with <coughs> in Johannesburg um, and across South Africa when he arrived. So I think there's a bit more than 300 works in the collection. Um, and the Johannesburg part of the collection process was facilitated by Mambongi Tlomo Maukla, who is here today. Um, <laughs> the documentary film that was shown or produced for A Labor of Love was, was really important. Um, number one, for thinking through the works that we were producing for the show in response to the collection, <clears throat> but also has become vital in the way we engage with our practices, either through teaching, producing work, or in me and Nat's case, running uh, a printmaking studio. Um, and print and publishing based artist collective. Um, so we, w we were not only given documentation of the works that were collected, but also the receipts, um, interview transcripts, discussions, photographs, um, everything that, that was kind of produced and collected either socially or for the Weltkulturmuseum Museum as an institution in, in 1986. So that became a jumping off point for the way we think about practical me research methodologies um, and engaging with archives. Because uh, we're blessed and, and honored to be in a position where a lot of the artists and works and practices that have influenced our practice so heavily are, are still around and still alive today. And we can go visit them and you know, hang out for a drink and have conversations. Um, and it's, it's a reflection of of what was discussed in um, the second last panel before lunch of the process of, of getting into your car with artist friends and going out and drinking, but also having conversations about, or intergenerational discussions. It creates this kind of almost visible network across history and begins to provide questions for us about what has changed, what hasn't, um, and how we can use those processes to um, engage, engage quite critically in, in our current context. Just to add on as well, our point of entry into the archive was, well, our first point of entry was kind of on the surface because we were handed over um, just documentation and uh, a lot of it was just receipts. So we were kind of upset that why have these artists sold their work for like 20 rand, 50 rand um, at that time. So, but however, what, what, what happened within the project was when we created the documentary, actually 
went back and had actual sit downs with um, the artists themselves. And only through those conversations that we had with them did more of the whole engagement that they had with the uh, collection, Hans Bloom as well, um, got more revealed. Um, for example, also, I think through the conversations that we had um, with the artists, um, I don't know about Chan and Nathaniel, but it felt very much that the struggles that they had during that time are still our struggles today. Um, a lot, I mean, a lot hasn't changed. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we that, having that conversation with those artists really influenced our engagement with the, the actual archive itself. Um, I looked at Mambongi, I was sitting there. I'm just gonna read a quote <laughs> that um, she said basically when we were, when we were interviewing her at WITS. Um, she said, we were young once, so we had the same struggles. I think it is the moment dealing with and defining the moment for yourself, but referencing because I think we exist in reference. So that really stuck with me. Um, and I was interested in how um, she was uh, very important in how Hans collected, because she was the point of contact, basically, to other artists and Hans Bloom. And she, her work wasn't collected, though, within the archive. So I, I took it upon myself, basically, to insert her voice within the archive itself. Um, so using reference as an artistic strategy, um, just to insert her within. So I looked at, because my work is, um, I look at uh, my grandfather's archive of a farm in Heidelberg where they were removed in 1965. Um, so uh, in Heidelberg. So my, my grandfather collected the history of this forced removal that took place. So I'm, I'm heavily invested in basically unpacking that archive, but looking at the South African context as well. Um, so basically undoing the archival interpretations of um, land uh, la uh, forced removals that have happened. Um, so the universal narrative that we are heavily bombarded with all the time, but these um, single voices which are not entering the archive. So I, I tend to just research that and unpack that within my own work. So I looked at her forced removal series um, and use that as a point of reference within my own work. H hence I said the same struggles that the artist encountered are still the same struggles that we are dealing with today. So yeah. Um, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was, there was a conversation in this particular interview um, or I don't like the word interview, maybe discussion, yeah, discussion. or moment of exchange. Yeah. Is, is a better way of th thinking about it. Um, in the same interview that Michelle or Bayetile just referenced now was myself and Nathaniel had at some, for some reason, this grand idea of, of starting uh, a print studio that functions very much outside of the way traditional Western print shops like David Crude or Artist Proof Studio or Artist Press um, function economically in terms of the artists that they have access, that they give access to the space, um, print conventions of, of producing and displaying work. Because um, we, we, at the time, we had our own ideas of, of how printmaking as a medium should be engaged with, particularly in Johannesburg in South Africa, where the medium is, is quite loaded in, in what, it's, what it does as opposed to what it, how it's produced. So <clears throat> we brought this question of, you know, when is the right time? How do we, how do we set up the space if it becomes a space? Um, in the conversation we're having with, with Mambongi, and she kind of chuckled a little bit and said, well, we went to, we went to Rock's Drift because that's, that was the first step. We didn't know what was gonna come after that. If you think it's the right time, then it's the right time, and you should just do it. And a few months after that, after we got back from Frankfurt, we were given the opportunity to, through a funder, to open up the space. So that conversation with, with Mambongi was, 
was kind of instrumental looking back in the way DGI as a space and as a collaborative practice and as a collective practice has progressed and then filtered through to myself and Nathaniel's teaching um, in the Vitz printmaking program. Can everybody, oh, yo. yep. Um, <laughs> and so to kind of go, I guess maybe further into how this practice kind of went from university students um, kind of first being confronted with this archive um, and this very particular archive and having the kind of also arrogance of our youth um, in thinking that we had already known something or another before that point um, and to kind of be humbled through the processes of kind of multiple communities um, to almost look back at it not necessarily in its academic form, but the way Chad and I begin to look back is similar to how you reference within hip hop. I do want to bring in yeah, hip hop yeah, for a yeah, second. Um, and this kind of constant battle between each other, between the works, being humbled by works that we are com constantly coming across in the archive, and to kind of fast forward to the point of being given and taken the opportunity to start a space, we started to not embody our own kind of ideals, but still try and understand this archive that we've been researching in university and how, not as a reflection, but more of what are these, what is this natural evolution that we have kind of been placed in and placed ourselves in as a space? Um, how do we look at all of the medium and materials that we've collected over time, considering how important we considered slips and receipts um, in the purchase of these works. But then how do we also close up gaps um, that we ended up kind of being confused by in terms of you know, economic situations, um, social situations. So for the next person who comes across us, whether inadvertent or you know, it's part of a university context, can take that in further. So, you know, what started off as some can say semi-selfish, you know, trying to create a space for one's own work soon becomes a humbling experience where the space takes on its own life regardless of you. Um, and I think a lot of our predecessors can share that sentiment where they planted seeds of kind of hope for, you know, artists and spaces to be able to inhabit Johannesburg and South Africa in a certain way. Um, but I think the rest kind of was a surprise to them. I think, I think that's an important point to bring up because there was, there's a question that, that came after um, Bob Charles and Pat's presentation asking about, you know, what, what is Rock's Drift or how is Rock's Drift being filtered into um, some kind of contemporary practice in, in Johannesburg or in South Africa. And I think <clears throat> it's, it's very, very present. Rock's Drift is, and, and the practices that we, the personal, the, the people and the practices that we engaged with at that time and have continued to engage with over time are, are very much present in the way DGIs run, as an example. Um, the way um, Bayetile engages with um, the development practice through the Center for Teaching and Learning Development. Um, the way we teach our students, Rock's Drift is, is extremely present in um, myself and Nathaniel's curriculum, not only in terms of looking at the work, but in terms of sharing stories with the students on how, how dissemination practices worked or how important the dissemination of your prints have to be because you're not always in a position for galleries to keep taking prints and putting them up. Um, and they were beautiful, just, just focusing on a small portion of a practice like print dissemination. Um, we place um, quite a big importance on that in our class because it's a way of, of doing things for yourself and a way of fostering relationships where there are people to, to lean on and share with instead of institutions. Um, and it's us being able to teach printmaking is, has been such a beautiful and, like Nat was saying, humbling process because we were receiving these echoes from Rock's Drift that were kind of happening in real time 
through the conversations we were having um, from 2015 in Volker Tudor Museum to 2017 when the show opened at JAG. And for us to be able in our own weird way to reflect those echoes and add in our own voices to students that are beginning to think about um, developing their own print practices means that Rourke's Drift is, is vital to the way we're thinking about not only producing prints, but thinking of printmaking as a, a kind of collective community of sharing practical and kind of theory, theoretical resources. Um, there's people you, you can rely on in like a very emotional way. Um, it's people that have skills that are on your side to push um, ideologies and, and produce things with, with very little access to resources. You wanna add? Yeah? Yeah, I kinda wanna add a little something. Okay, go for it. <laughs> I think we have some time. Um, no, this is, you know, some some things, you know, that I was thinking about you know, presently. Um, we've kind of began, especially when we started to professionalize our careers, whatever the devil that means. <laughs> um, you know, we obviously were confronted with the first issue of either being really, really bad at selling prints, even though that's in theory what we were making and trying to use to pay rent and pay bills and things like that um, because of this kind of knack of wanting to just share information and share things, the amount of times we probably give away prints for free. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, it's because we've both also bridged the gap between spaces like David Crit um, and DGI, where I was confronted with why the, the people that we look back on so fondly, you know, these Rock's Drift artists, why were they printing editions of 200 and in technical terms were speckly and skew and the borders were off and, you know, these are things that would make, you know, some print studios faint um, <laughs> and freak out and why, you know, places like DK or David Crit concerned about these things and lower edition sizes. Um, we started looking at it in terms of printmakers as miniature economic models. Um, you know, understanding one's own economics um, in relation to the work that you make and the information that you put out there. Um, and these are since looking at those kind of slips and receipts and traces of money, we started to try and figure out why there are these seemingly arbitrary um, discrepancies um, and what are the underlying sometimes racial, sometimes social um, reasons for them. And so through the space, not only are we trying to push printing um, in the practice of making, but also understanding, you know, these seemingly intense forces um, and understanding your worth and your value as a laborer and as a, you know, producer of work. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like um, at the end of this project, um, we also had questions about how many more artists uh, that we couldn't reach because they are far away or their work hasn't been documented. Um, where, where do their voices lie? Um, particularly with me uh, looking at why I started the research with my own family history's archive, my grandfather's archive. I started because there wasn't any research um, or rather documentation of this particular forced removal. So where do those um, voices lie? Um, so with everybody here on the panel and um, the other artists as well who are on this particular project, I feel like we were not only questioning that particular archive, but looking back at the South African landscape itself. Um, where, when are we going to have more platforms basically where those artists are also engaged with um, What's, what's happening um, today. So, um, and also if we don't, who will basically? Yeah. We need to be active in writing those histories. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's important in thinking about writing histories. Um, and, and this relates quite strongly to, to this issue that, or the problematics that, that generally 
comes up in, in panel discussions when people are quick to ask very biographical questions about artists from, from Rourke's Drift or from that time, artists whose works are, are constantly being labeled as transitional mm. or resistance, yeah. um, township art. Um, it's important, it's very important practice for us at least to, to situate ourselves in a space where we're discussing anecdotes and we're, dis we're sharing with students, but also introducing very conceptual linkages to the medium of print and why it was important in, in Johannesburg at the time, the you know, conceptually, physically working a plate, um, what that meant in, in Rourke's Drift and what that means for students in the print shop at Wits. Uh, making students aware that there was an illegal silk UDF silkscreen facility uh, underneath the Great Hall at at the time um, to make it clear to students that um, the attack on Medu in in Botswana in 1985 just just to throw these these stories in while discussing their practices conceptually with students builds for us quite a strong foundational level for them to to go out and find their own research practices and come and have chats with us. We, we try to bring in as many guests that are part of our artistic network as well into class to discuss with students because we're trying to, in some ways, correct institutional art history as, as small amount as we can, um, but also um, get them ready to be comfortable in the way they're talking about um, their context in relation to a, a very important history that came before them and how to build on that. Yeah, do you want to add anything? Questions? Does anyone have questions Question. or comments or criticalities, <laughs> fights? <laughs> I've got a question. Yes. <laughs> Are you going to show us some images? Of the work that we produced? <laughs> no. <laughs> there is there is a catalog that exists. Um, so a catalog was published in uh, Frankfurt, and when the show came to Johannesburg Art Gallery, it, it's quite a comprehensive catalog of all the photos that were taken, or a majority of the photos that were taken in the 80s during the time of the collection. <coughs> Some photographs that were taken um, in 2015 when we started working on the project. All the receipts all the works that were shown in the exhibition, as well as writing um, that myself and Matilana Kakaza did when we were in fourth year. So it's not my best writing, <laughs> but <laughs> there is there's some writing in there, including essays by Gabi Kobo, Yvette Mutumba, um, I think Same, Sami Mdluli, Dr. Sami Mdluli wrote um, an essay for the catalog as well. Um, and then a really, really important practice that exists in, in this catalog is um, a breakdown in artist bio of almost all the artists um, that we could find information about um, inside this, this one book. So if, if you guys are around JAG, I think it's, it's important that you go check out the catalog and there is information online about the exhibition. And watch the yeah. documentary. I feel like it's the conversations that are really important. Yeah. Um, because it's only through those conversations where we, where we were able to understand. Um, it was a really a point of contact because um, even when I was a student undergrad, um, with professional practice, um, we never really got a chance to meet these artists. Um, it was not a platform that was given for us to engage with these artists. Um, so. The, the conversations, I really urge you to watch the documentary. It's the conversations in there. Hence, even Chad mentioned um, uh, transitional art. That came from uh, the discussion we had with David Golane, where we were asking him, so if this was, you were being labeled at the time, there were these labels um, um, that they were given um, as artists. I, I, asked, I posed the question to him, um, how were you undoing those labels? And he said he was writing, um, but however, we had never encountered a piece of work, a, a, a written piece of work of yeah. David Golani. 
Um, As so, fourth year students and an MA yeah, student so at that were, point, we had never encountered. There um, are lots of gaps, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Okay, I think we've got about six minutes for questions, so... Oh, there we go. Yeah, so we'll, we'll circulate this around. Um, Mambongi, is this yours? Yes. Yes, that's Mambongi's <laughs> copy, so we'll circulate it around so that you guys can have a look. Thanks, Balatia. Okay, are there any questions uh, that you'd like to put to Balatia, Chad, and Nathaniel about the project that they worked on? And the, so do we have a question from Colin? Do, can, we take, can we take two more? Who founded the project? It was the Veldkart Student Museum, so it was uh, partly state funded, but then also the Turn Foundation mm. yeah, in Frankfurt. Okay, are there other questions that you'd like to ask? Okay, Racine Kulalekul's hand again. Bongi, is your hand up as well? Okay, Bongi. Um, okay, should we take those two? So, Kulalekul first, and then we'll go to Bongi. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. It was regarding Mam Bongi's work that you said it was not found uh, within the collection. Mm. Did you ask why is that when you, were, you went? through to Frankfurt. Yeah. So what Mambongi and Hans had a relationship where Hans always relied on her, I guess, to connect her with other artists. So she, would, she played a pivotal role within how he collected the work. Um, so what happened is he didn't collect her work. Um, I guess maybe when she's up here, you can ask her why she didn't collect her work. However, I felt that it was important that because we keep hearing her, um, her voice within the conversations, I, I wanted to insert her voice within the collection. How, and again, the way I inserted her was as a reference. As she said, we exist in reference. Um, so I, I basically wrote a text on a, on a wall where I referenced her forced removal um, series, which spoke really back to my work um, and again, I showed that in, in Frankfurt, on a wall, it was removed. So there's always that moment in the archive where things come up and then they disappear again. So it was really just using reference as an artistic strategy because then you are able to insert her, but then she'll always get removed. But again, when we have these conversations, she comes back within, um, yeah. Um, I think, Mamongi, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so Hans Blum had a collection of, of Mamongi's prints in his personal archive, but um, in terms of him collecting for the institution, uh, her work was not present in the collection, but she facilitated a majority of the connections he was making with artists both here and uh, further down in, in the Cape. Because I think it's, it's very important because, I mean, at that time, being a black female mm -hmm. in the visual arts, um, it's quite limiting. I mean, I'm, I'm also looking at the exhibition at the Standard Bank Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. You know, there is not black female voice coming through. So it, it, it's quite important that even here, I, I, it's a pity that she arrived late because I would like to hear her voice coming from Rock's Drift, being a black female artist. So I hope we get a bit of time so we can have Bongi, Mam Bongi, coming to say something. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 to Bongi now. <laughs> and the mic happens to go to her, so maybe she can respond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, quiet. <laughs> Uh, no, firstly, the reason I put my hand up was to, co to just commend you. I, I have a confession to make. I saw you, you came over and greeted me, and I said, I can't remember the way. <laughs> For, uh, you've grown up. Yeah. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> no, from those shy <laughs> kids who are interviewing me at the office with Gabby, you've grown up. I'm so, so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So when you look at me, I must know them, I know them, I know them. Then when you started talking, I said, oh, yes, I put them. <laughs> My voice is here. <laughs> It's here. Um, uh, but I mean, my, my not being featured in the exhibition is really, it's, it's called ethics uh, because there was money exchanging hands. Even now, I'm collecting for a new museum. My work is not in, the co in that collection. It's a new collection made out of the 20th century black artists. I, I will not appear. On that, on that collection because of the is money exchanging hands. But as you were saying correctly, there is a lot of my work within uh, Reverend Hans Bloom's own collection that he used in the 80s to preach around in the, in the Lutheran churches around. So he, they're packaged in two boxes, right? They're in two boxes. The, first removers, women at work, and a, and a number of series that, that I worked on, and he showed them, but the museum didn't buy the work from him. So the work exists in Germany in a private collection that, it, that Reverend Bloom used at different times. I was in um, Frankfurt in 1987, I think, yeah, 87, and he put the work up in his church in Frankfurt, and I spoke to the work, to the congregation. The only good thing with Germany is that the churches are very short. It's one hour, so <laughs> <laughs> I had a very short time to talk about my work. But he used it. I think a lot of our work in the 80s was used, uh, as we did work, it was more to conscientize. And I think Brother uh, Charles has spoken about that if he's, he referred to his work as, mm -hmm. as work that we did uh, because there was a, a, an urgent call and an urgent, um, in politics they call it mandate. We had a mandate to, to, to sort of work towards highlighting the liberation struggle. The unfortunate, unfortunate thing is that when the politicians came back, they didn't tell us not to, to stop. Yeah. So we don't know what to do at the moment. So we just sort of do things. But uh, the, the reason the work is not there, and they asked, I explained that it was really because there was money. 20 rands, there were 20 rands exchanging hands, but in 86, 20 rands was a lot of yeah. money. <laughs> yeah. My time at Rock Swift. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be brief, honest. I didn't know what I was going to do in Rock Swift. I, was, I had been working in a in a sugar company, because I did a secretarial course, and I didn't want to be a teacher, I didn't want to be a nurse, I didn't want to, I couldn't afford to be a doctor. So there were a number of things that stopped me from going to university. Parents and uh, money. They, they just didn't have the money to, to put me through school. So my going to Ross really was because in the work that I was doing, uh, as a, as a secretary, no, as a typist. I trained to be a secretary, but I ended up as a typist. And I put myself back to school, to Rock Rift. I discovered that there were only, there were three of us ladies, and there were 14 males, including the husband. <laughs> 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 including the husband, who was not a husband then. And, and then we, we, in the following year, there were 16 of us. It was a very small school. They, very rarely there would be a third year student, but we were always first year and second year. I was going to do a third year because I really love printmaking as you have maybe seen. And, but my dad passed away in November of my second year, so I couldn't do a third year. And, but my time there was really discovering how to speak through art. Uh, but the, the most exciting thing is that Rock Rift is situated in, a, in this uh, Battle of Rock Rift facility. So 
the people who come from the old country to come and see the graves had money. So if we knew there was a tourist bus coming, we would print immediately and drive these and get things to drive away and sell at school. So we made a lot of money within the exchange of prints with tourists because most of the work was talking about the work that we're doing at school as very much around religion because we were in a religious situation. But after we left, we knew that this was a vehicle uh, to communicate things that were urgent in the political struggle. And uh, again, through the people like Tami Miele in uh, the, the Medu and the people, they, we were sort of given this mandate to use prints because they were multiples. So, and they were cheaper to sell, and you could create multiples, so you could sell. They were democratic. So, <laughs> prints are still a, a very democratic way of uh, uh, selling art. And so, my, but I think personally, just printmaking gives me the thing. And I, at the moment, I'm working with Joe. He's over there. Mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing, for the first time, I'm doing. Uh, what do we do? Life, <laughs> life graphy, which I've never done. And so, uh, watch the space, as the president said. Watch the space, me and Joe are going places. But I'm very proud of you guys, really. And I mean, I know Gabi is very proud of you. Thanks, guys. I just suspect that maybe the reason you weren't in that collection is for ethical reasons. And I think that's something really good. Like, especially now with all the corruption in South Africa, that's a really good principle. But I want to say the issue about gender does come through in terms of Rourke's Drift and in terms of the Standard Bank Gallery exhibition. And it's very, very clear. And those issues about gender and how women are taught or not taught and what they taught, whether they taught printmaking or painting or bronze sculpture, whether they taught weaving, is still with us. Cause I'm sorry, I'm going to refer to the bag factory, and I know this doesn't even apply for, to you. Look at the number of women, the, the race, the gender, the class of the people here, and those art awards that were first given. All the first five people who got them were men. So issues about gender are still around, still around today, and we can't just ignore that. So that was quite nice about Cedric's documentary, that you interviewed the woman, actually, in your film. That was actually very, very nice to see. And maybe simply because they're still around, maybe a different kind of filmmaker would not have interviewed them. And I think we've always got to think about that. Thanks, Carolyn. 